Anity. I request Professor Rajkumar Chakraborty to introduce him to you. Professor Rajkumar Chakraborty, please. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Shona yeah, Yatsalo. Today I am very pleased to say that my longtime friend, Siru Prachudhuri, at present, Professor of Theoretical Physics, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, is with us. I know Siru since my college days. We were batchmates in BSc, MSc, and so on. He was famous amongst us for his short height, intelligence, ready wit, and sense of humor. Anyway, Professor Rai Chaudhuri has a very shining academic career. After graduating from Presidency College, Calcutta, he did his post-graduation and PhD from Calcutta University. He worked as a postdoc in TIFR and San Geneva. He taught at IIT Kanpur for nine years before joining the faculty at TIFR. His research interests lie in interfacing theory with experiment, especially in the physics of electroweak interactions. Apart from having a large number of publications in reputed journals, he has authored two books. He is also interested in science popularization and history of science. He has given several popular level talks in different universities and institutions. So I hope my dear students and my esteemed colleagues will enjoy his talk. So without wasting too much time, I like to hand over to Professor Rai Chaudhuri to start his talk. Okay. Yes, so I think I'll start by sharing. I'll turn off my video and I'll share my screen first. Then let us see. Is the full screen coming? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, it's okay. okay. Okay, thank you. So let me start by thanking Dr. Khan, uh, Professor Chatterjee. Uh, for uh, in the Chakravarti for inviting me, my good friend Rajkumar, for the very warm welcome and uh, the introduction. And I will be talking about the topics of nature, science, and humanity. That actually covers almost everything. But I will be giving you some random thoughts about this, just discussing things. A little bit at random, a little bit of history, a little bit of sociology, a little bit of science, uh, sort of the way things happen in real life. And I hope I will be able to give you, uh, keep you engaged for an hour or so. And also, I hope that I will give you some food for thought, which you young people in particular will be able to think of uh, in, your, in your future careers and your future lives. So let us start with nature. And you know, nature provides some of the most beautiful things from Canada, but it, we have equally beautiful things in our own country. And here is a picture of the Aurora Borealis, a video of that. These often inspire us with sheer awe and wonder at the beauty and grace and lovely things which we see in nature. But nature, can also be terrifying to us puny humans. Uh, as you see, this, this picture of a tsunami hitting the, this is the 2004 tsunami hitting a place in Thailand, and it can be terrifying and deadly, dangerous and deadly effect. So, before the growth of science, humans were afraid of these more negative aspects of nature. And because of this fear, I, this is portrayed in this famous painting by the painter Goya, which was painted after in 1812, after the 
famous Lisbon earthquake of 1812. That, you know, it was a picture, they felt that like a huge giant was shaking the earth and people were, as you see, are escaping as desperately as they can. So they had this picture that the negative aspects of nature must be coming from some kind of thing like this. And if you read Asterix, then of course the most important thing they used to think that the sky will fall off their heads. And that is a, a, another indication of the kind of irrational fear which people had in those days. So they tried to explain these uh, natural disasters as arising from the anger of some supernatural beings. So I show you two pictures. One is a story from the Bible, how Adam and Eve were expelled by the archangel from the Garden of Eden and made to live in the world with all its, uh, all its difficulties and all its dangers. And here is a picture of the God of Death, Yama, as portrayed in the Tibetan mythology. So you see that, there, that these pictures itself show you that there's, that there's a fear in the minds of people. And so they tried to think that since these supernatural beings get angry so easily, let us try to appease or to calm them down or to divert this by doing some worship and sacrifice. Here is a picture from, again, from the Bible, the film, the Bible, which came in 2013. This is Abraham trying to sacrifice his son to God. Of course, he finally did not sacrifice it. Story. So there's a happy ending to this particular story. But we do know that countless sacrifices have happened in the past. You see this rather disturbing picture. So countless animals and a fair number of humans have also suffered because of this fear. And it has not had any good effect whatsoever. Nine of the four famous uh, problems of mankind which were uh, identified by the Buddha long ago, age, disease, poverty, death, none of them are abate, have been abated even a little bit by having the, doing all these sacrifices and such things. So they are still with us. We have not solved these problems. And not only that, you see a picture here of plague victims in London, 1665, there was no lack of praying and sacrificing to the gods, to the god in those days. You see, this is a mass grave. And a closer picture, we have all seen this picture, I think, closer to us today. And again, no amount of prayer and other things have solved this. It is science, both pure and applied science, which has raised humans above this state of ignorance and terror and made us the proud masters of nature. Even today, it is science, it is vaccination, and it is uh, hospitalization on which we depend in the middle of this pandemic to save us from the from death or from very severe disease at the hands of COVID-19. And it is also through science that the human soul and spirit has been able to stand upright, just as the human, uh, over the years, the human body has been able to stand upright. Similarly, the science that has made it possible for the human sure. spirit to stand upright and to face the nature with confidence. So this talk is going to trace the history of science and how it came and also its liberating effect on the human mind. So it's a story, it's a storytelling session. and. Uh, I will not actually talk about science or the technicalities of science in this talk. Well, even 150 years ago, if you went from one place to the other, you would go in a horse cart like this. Almost everything was run by human or animal muscles. And if you think of this picture, this is the cockpit of a plane which is landing, that appears incredibly primitive compared to today's machines and devices. <clears throat> the kind of technology we have at our disposal. So technology has changed our lives so dramatically that we would find it extremely difficult today if we were suddenly transposed even for a day to the homes of our, let us say, our great grandparents, maybe who lived in the 19th century. If you take us there, we would find it extremely difficult to live there. I mean, there are so many things without which we cannot survive a day. 
Well, if at that time, if you felt hot, this was the only, you would have to fan yourself with a hand fan. <laughs> no AC, no electric fan. If you wanted to write to somebody, you would sit with a piece of letter. Whereas today, of course, you simply send a message. As you have just said, you send the WhatsApp. Then I should like to therefore mention that science and technology, they go hand in hand and they cannot be separated just like a married couple cannot, should not be separated. Each draws benefits from each and none would survive without the other. So science is as important as technology and technology is as important as science and one cannot proceed without the other. So that will also be woven into my narrative. So therefore, this talk is also going to trace the history of technology a little bit and its impact on our progress in science. So they are intertwined. This picture is from 1875. It is a picture of Adolf Menzel called the Iron Rolling Mill. Today, of course, iron mills are much more uh, sophisticated, but this is how the, the early factories started. It's a very beautiful picture, a famous painting. <clears throat> okay, so let's go back and look at the birth of modern science. So medieval European thought, which is, let us say, somewhere between uh, up to 500 or years ago, was controlled and regulated by the Catholic Church, and they believed in the Bible. And the Bible is a book which was written essentially between 4,000 to 2,000 years ago, and therefore the ideas in it also belong to those times. However, often if you had tried to think freely, there was compulsion. So you see in this picture, a uh, woodcut showing that this poor gentleman who is sitting in front is being asked to whether he believes in the words of Jesus or not. You know, this, you can see the cross and here are the, are the, the bishops and others and somebody's writing down all these words on this left side. And of course, if you were not found, if you found that you were not giving the right answers, then it could end in a horrific death. If people used to be actually burnt alive for this and uh, therefore this stifled uh, the growth of modern thought. Now around 1270, what is this to do with science? Around 1270, an Italian monk called Tommaso del Aquino or otherwise in Latin, Thomas Aquinas, he had published a theological textbook called the Summa Theologica. And you see a facsimile of an old version uh, of the time. <clears throat> now, in which he proposed a set of five logical arguments to prove the existence of God. Now, there, of course, these are logical fallacies, but people thought of them as good logic at the time. And these were borrowed actually closely from the writings of Aristotle. So they were not his original logical arguments, they were borrowed from Aristotle. As a result, now a little bit of word about Aristotle, he was a Greek polymath, a man who knew about many subjects as diverse as logic, ethics, poetics, politics, mathematics, astronomy, even beekeeping. So he was undoubtedly the greatest intellectual genius of antiquity. There is no question about the brilliance and genius of Aristotle. So he sort of systematized knowledge of his time. The time, as you see, was the 4th century BC. Now, the Summa Theologica, let's come back to that, was a runaway success. It was so popular that the church made it the prescribed textbook on theology in all the universities of the time in Europe. And partly because of the success of this work, the church and medieval thinkers began to believe that Aristotle had to be right. He couldn't wrong. He was infallible. He just couldn't be wrong in anything. And this slavish mentality that Aristotle has to be right, Aristotle cannot make a mistake, it set back progress in science for several centuries. Modern science therefore began as a revolt against the theories of Aristotle, which is not fair to Aristotle because he was a great man and he did a lot of for science. But this is what happens when you have the same idea with, and hold it, hold on to it for a, more than a thousand years. Then this happens that it's a back idea and therefore only a revolt can solve it. So before, 
let me remind you of some of the biggest mistakes which were there in Aristotle, and some of them will seem funny today. Well, one of them was that the Earth is the center of the universe. We know it's not true, but uh, it's not. It's an excusable mistake. The sky is a crystal sphere surrounding the Earth. Well, that's what it looks like, so that's what we thought. Objects in the sky are eternal and unchanging. They are not, but they don't change very fast. So once again, these are excusable mistakes. The most natural motion is in a circle. Now, he came to it from the idea that the circle looks identical from all directions. And therefore, uh, this was his idea. This is the one which you learned in your school text. Heavier bodies fall faster than lighter bodies. This was not true. And again, these are excusable. Minajul, please switch your audio. Minajul, please switch off your audio. Minajul Abedin. Please switch off your audio. Please continue, sir. Okay. Now, the, this one is a less excusable mistake. He said that in all animals, the male is bigger than the female. Then he also said, now this is inexcusable, that men have more teeth than women. That shows you that I, think, I don't think he ever bothered to count. Then, I don't know how he made this mistake, because he was a married man. Men have higher body temperature than women. So, I don't know what Mrs. Aristotle thought about this. Then he also felt that life can grow spontaneously from dead objects, which we know is not true. And finally, he comment on fossils, that fossils have no relation to life forms. And we really should have this uh, background stop. Uh, can the host mute this, please? Which one, sir? Can you, this, what we can background uh, sound us, sir. Background is Okay, sir, okay, sir, okay. Uh, please, the host can please mute it because it's disturbing. Okay, thanks. So then he said the fossils have no relation to life forms. Now these are, you will wonder that how did, oh, one more. The heart is the seat of our thinking facility. We think from the heart. But some people do, I suppose. But, you know, you can wonder that how did one man make so many mistakes? But, you know, if one man writes an encyclopedia on his own, it's likely that he will make mistakes. And without any, a lot, a lot of it was without any experiments to guide him, but just from ideas. So, therefore, as I said, the revolt against Aristotle is what started science. And it was led by three persons. The first was a Polish monk called Nicholas Copernic. We know him as Copernicus, who lived between 1473 to 1543. The second was also a monk who actually was thrown out of the Catholic Church, Giordano Bruno, who lived in Italy between 1548 to 1600. And the third is a more familiar name, Galileo Galilei, also who lived in Italy and was uh, younger, much, uh, about one generation after Bruno. Now, what are the things which they said, which are contrary to Aristotle? Copernicus, as you know, said that the sun and not the earth is the center of the universe. Bruno said that there are many suns and many earths in the universe. And for a long time, there was no proof of this. But today, with the discovery of exoplanets, almost every day there are new planets that they discover. <laughs> he has been proved to be spectacularly proved to be correct. And Galileo, showed that objects in the sky are subject to decay and change. So these are all contrary to the things which Aristotle told us. However, the climate was not suitable in those days to make these views well known. What happened? Copernicus, he never dared to publish in his lifetime. On his deathbed, he sent his manuscript to a friend in Amsterdam, which was outside the Catholic Church's uh, rule and asked him to publish it. Giordano Bruno, unfortunately, went and made his statements to the Catholic Church and he was burnt alive for refusing to deny his opinions. Galileo again was in Italy. He was captured by the church. He was imprisoned and he was forced to burn his own books. But it is said, and this is a story, of course, 
that at his trial, when Galileo was forced to say that the earth is fixed and the sun moves around it, he said to have looked at his friends and tapped with his foot, as you can see he's doing in the, on the earth to say that yes, but still it moves. Whatever they may force me to say, still the earth is moving. So here is a picture, of course, painted much later of this uh, incident. Well, Galileo also read the revolt in mechanics. So, as I told you, you know that Aristotle said that heavier bodies fall faster than lighter bodies. So, you know that Galileo did this famous experiment. He, he lived in Pisa, so he climbed to the top of the tower of Pisa and he threw two balls from there, one light and one heavy, and he found that they landed at the same time. So, therefore, clearly Aristotle was wrong in this. The other beautiful argument which he proved so Aristotle had said that natural motion is in a circle. So Galileo said, let's take two inclined plates and then put a ball and let it roll down. Of course, it will bounce up to the same height. Okay, that's easy to prove. Now, take this uh, longer plank and change the angle. Okay, let it bounce. It will come up to the same height, so it travels a greater length. Make it even more flat. It will travel to an even greater length just to come up to the same height. So, what will happen if you make it flat? You simply go on. And you could do the same on the other side. So, that means that if something came rolling from uh, far away to the left, it will keep on rolling to the far right. So, that means that the natural motion is not in a circle but in a straight line. A beautiful argument. And again, it proved Aristotle wrong. Now, though the church and the Aristotelians, the followers of Aristotle, managed to silence Galileo, his works were widely read in secret, secretly in Catholic countries and openly in Protestant countries where the Pope had no power. So here is a picture of Europe uh, as it was in those days. You see the blue areas, the grayish blue areas are the areas controlled by the Catholic Church and the yellow areas were Protestant where the church had no power. And of course, uh, the, the, the Sion areas are the ones which were controlled by the Muslims. And Rome, as you see, is the red spot in the center. So Galileo, poor fellow, was close to Rome and Pisa around here. Bruno was in Rome, so of course they had it. But uh, Copernicus lived here within the Catholic Church area, but he sent his uh, manuscript to Amsterdam, where it was published without difficulty. Now, once released from the fetters of orthodoxy, scientific thought grew by leaps and bounds. So, some of the major discoveries, Leonardo da Vinci, you have heard of him, of course, uh, did found many discoveries, new discoveries in anatomy. He found the laws of friction. He devised a helicopter and a battle tank, none of which were built in his time, but which have been built later on the same principles. Tycho Brahe, he discovered a nova or a new star, clearly proving that things change in the celestial world. Johann Kepler, you have all heard of him. He devised the laws of planetary motion. Planets don't move in a circle, they move in ellipses. So again, that breaks from the Aristotelian tradition. And William Harvey proved that the heart is responsible for the circulation of blood. That is its function and not the function of thinking. So, all this laid the ground for Isaac Newton. Now, Isaac Newton, like uh, Aristotle, was a man who could do many things, but he was essentially a mathematician and a physicist. But he was also an alchemist, a theologian, a manier, and who laid the foundations of theoretical physics. Of course, we know that by discovering the laws of motion and so many other things. So there is no question that Newton possess the greatest scientific mind of all time. Nobody has ever equaled his uh, total achievement. He is basically the creator of modern science. And this is the famous book, the Principia Mathematica, the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, which is what we call science today. It was published in 1687. This is 1687 in Roman numerals. So here is a Epitaph composed by the poet uh, Alexander Pope for Newton. 
nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be and all was light. Well, this is an exaggeration. And finally, Newton let him be written on his epitaph. That is some long, long things on it. I've seen it. But on his tomb, there is some other inscription. But so anyway, with Newton, modern science may fairly be said to have begun. Now, another aspect which we often forget is sometime around 1590 to 1620, Dutch opticians invented the telescope and the compound microscope. Now, Galileo took out the telescope and he made his great discoveries with it, but he did not have much time for the microscope. In fact, nor did Newton. The microscope was used with effect by the Dutch uh, scientist Anton van Leeuwenhoek and Robert Hooke in England. Now, they discovered a whole world of invisible creatures which is far more varied than what we see. So this uh, little animation you see here, this is actually a picture of an amoeba. You see that object in the center and you see how the amoeba has just swallowed up a paramecium and is digesting it. And as you can see, it keeps changing shape. And uh, see, it, it imbibed some water also just now. Other paramecia roaming about in the area. But this one, as you see in the center, is getting well and truly digested. So there is this whole world of creatures and they are all around us. Take a drop of water, there is that. So let's go ahead. These are bacteria. All right. Everywhere, all around you. Because you just can't, they're too small to be seen. Well, this is a virus. This is actually a coronavirus, but it is not the coronavirus. This is a virus, an ape virus similar to the one which has been used to create this uh, COVID shield uh, or AstraZeneca vaccine. So you see all these uh, little things on the top, which with which it uses to latch on to another uh, cell. Then these horrible looking creatures are all around you. They are on your on your clothes. They are on your things. They are called dust mites. Magnified many times, they live on dust. They live in the dust. They are. They cannot be distinguished from dust and they feed on the dead cells which fall from your body. So they're there all out there, they're in your pillow, in your bed. So I hope that doesn't give you nightmares. These are pollen grains, pollen grains which looks like a fine powder. Fine, but actually if you look at it on the microscope, there are so many kinds of structures there. And you see again here that there are these little spikes on it, similar to the virus which enables it to stick to the insect which is uh, coming to the flower. Well, the result of this discovery was that in 1546, Frascatoro at Verona proposed that diseases are caused by microscopic spores. Previous to that, people thought that diseases are caused either by, by, by your lifestyle or diseases are caused by the gods being angry with you or some such thing, or you have the punishment of sin or something. So the germ theory of disease was proposed by Frascato. Around 18 And uh, he proved that this is caused by a bacteria. And he also proved that, you know, if you use a, a wash it with boric acid, the bacteria might save the lives of hundreds of women in 19th century France. So perhaps we could say that, you know, the germ theory was proved and uh, we also started finding cures for this. So the war against disease and death, of course, it's the biggest uh, war which we have ever fought and we are still fighting it. But here are some of the heroes of that. Edward Jenner discovered vaccination on which we are all depending even today. Robert Koch found a cure for tuberculosis, Pasteur again for rabies, Paul Elish for syphilis, Hafkin for cholera, 
Claude Nicole for typhus, Ronald Ross for malaria, this discovery was made in India, and Benning for diphtheria. So all these diseases today, we don't take them so seriously. They were, they, we used to die of them 100 years back, you could die of any of them at any time. And today, of course, we think of them as curable diseases. If it happens, okay, it's fine, you'll get cured. We thank all these gentlemen you see here for that. And finally, the discovery of antibiotics completely changed the face of medical treatment. Let's look at this, how this came about. Joseph Lister, he used bandages which were moldy, which was covered with the penicillin mold, and he found that they cured wounds. And similarly, Ernest Duquesner found that you can cure guinea pigs from typhus by using injections of this penicillin mold. He was a medical doctor, as you can see from his uniform. But the actual discovery came with Alexander Fleming as late as 1928. And I would say that Alexander Fleming's discovery of antibiotics has made huge changes to the world we live in. And these are the kind of things which will be cured by penicillin. Gangrene, septicemia, leprosy, typhoid, purple fever, that's the one which uh, pasture cured. Chlamydia, tooth abscess, that's so long, the long list. And during the Second World War, penicillin was produced in huge quantities, and it certainly helped the Americans in particular uh, to fight in places where otherwise they would not have been able to. Now, let's come back to India and see how these discoveries have affected the average life expectancy. And you will find some very interesting information here. So these are, these are the various census years, 1941 to 51, 51 to 61, and so on. So we have the data up to 2011. We will get new data this year. But uh, let's look at how the life expectancy varied. On the left side, I'm plotting the number of years. So this is roughly your age, I guess, somewhere a little below 20. And see how the life expectancy rose over the years. So this is entirely because of the advancement of science, medical science in particular, but also other sciences. So notice something that if it had been the year between 1941 and 1951, around the time we got our independence, all of you young people who are listening to me, you would already have finished half your expected lives. More than half would have been gone. And this, of course, decreased over years. Now, let me move this to my age. So, had it been before night in the 90s, 80s, then I wouldn't be here to give you this lecture. It's only because we are now in this 21st century that I'm able to give you this lecture. If you go by average, of course. So, it's a significant change. But the result of this change, of course, is that in the past century, death was always very close to our door. We have I've seen a little glimpse of that during the COVID pandemic. I will quote for you a poem by Renia Maria Rilke. Death is great, we are in his keep, laughing galore when we deem ourselves deep. In life, he dares weep deep in our core. So death is always present, and we never know when death will come. But it is science which has made death seem to be a remote thing. We owe it to modern science that it has freed us from the fear of imminent death. You can be a happy family. Because you're not afraid that the next day you will die. We have seen a little bit of that fear come back during the COVID pandemic. But once again, we are gradually coming out of it. And the fear is going away, thanks to vaccination, thanks to science. Okay, let me again now shift to something else. What are the characteristics of modern science? What characterizes, what is modern science? Well, the first is the idea of materialism. All phenomena have material causes that are knowable to all who study them. You don't need to be a special person to understand. If you study them, you will understand the causes. The second is observability. So science observes only those phenomena which are observable by the senses or with instruments. Now, this, of course, means that it does not everything. There could be phenomena which are not observable by the senses. It's just that science doesn't deal with them. 
there's a question of objectivity. So the description of phenomena must be unambiguous, preferably mathematical, but if not mathematical, also a clear description such that everyone can understand and it doesn't change from time to time. Reproducibility, which means that the same set of causes must produce the same set of effects. So it's not that different things will happen at different times. There's the idea of correspondence, which is that any new theory cannot completely remove an old theory. It must reduce to the old theory where it was correct. Because after all, the old theory worked, it is based on observation and objectivity. So the old theory must be, will be wrong only when you apply it to a new domain. So all of these five things put together are the characteristics of what we call Western empirical science. So this is not all of knowledge. This is called Western empirical science, and we just use the word science too uh, as a short form for that. Now, of course, empirical science has rigidly defined its own scope, and there is a lot of things which are outside. It. I mean, something like whether something is good or evil, for example, ethics is not part of science. So let's let me quote the famous statement from Newton. I don't know what I may seem to the world, but as to myself, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and so on. And the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Here is a beautiful uh, video from a BBC documentary, which shows that. So perhaps science is like that boy who is sort of wading through the unknown, suddenly found something interesting. And there is so much unknown that is still possible. However, we work with what we know. And that is, and that itself has changed our society very, very dramatically. So applications of the scientific method have changed much of the way we think about the world around us. Well, human beings, we don't think of ourselves as the center of the universe anymore. This is a picture from a medieval uh, illustration, medieval document. You see the crystal sphere on which all the stars are there. And here is this person who has reached the end of the earth and his stick is poking out through the crystal sphere. So we don't think of this anymore. What we think of it is a world with different galaxies. This is from the Hubble Space Telescope. Far away galaxies and uh, who knows what of those galaxies. This is a sort of picture of our galaxy. And we will be somewhere on one of those outer arms of this. Picture of the sun with the planets around it. And finally, we come to our Earth and Moon. And we are somewhere on this planet. <clears throat> then natural phenomena are ascribed to natural causes. You see a, a video here of a volcanic eruption. This is in Indonesia. Uh, so earlier when volcanoes were erupted, volcanoes erupted and these lava people thought that there is some uh, fabulous beast which lives under the volcano and which is exerting fire, something like a dragon. But of course, we don't believe in dragons anymore. We have a nice picture. We believe that there is a sea of molten magma below it. And when some uh, something gives way, some weakness happens, then the magma flows out and comes out as lava. We have a mechanical or a, or a materialistic model for that. Today, our lives are much more dependent on machines. So here are three machines without which I think you could not live a day. You need your water supply, you need your light, and you need your fan. And I think it... And, I think even if the even recently during the cyclones and so on, these have stopped for a day or two, and you have seen how much distress we are doing. And I think one more thing which is almost equally important today is the cell phone. You probably will find it very difficult to live for a day without your mobile phone. But there are other instruments which we take for granted in our lives today: the fridge, the gas burner, the mixer, the microwave oven. TV, washing machine, we take all these for granted. Of course, also cars, laptops, ACs, depending on your uh, status in society. But without any machines, it would be very difficult to live our lives today. Moreover, since we expect to live longer, and this will not probably affect you at your age, but people tend to plan their lives much more than people used to do earlier. See, if you know that you are not going to live beyond 45, you don't bother to make too many savings for your old age. But if you know that you're going to live to 70 and 80, then you had better make plans to have some income at that stage. So therefore, people's lives are also much more planned today. 
Well, how did this technological dominance arise? Now, let me devote a little bit of time to technology. So, it came, of course, with the discovery of the steam engine. By first, by Savary. You see here an uh, animation of Savary's steam engine. And then modified by Newcomen and finally modified by James Watt. And also the discovery of electrical machines. First of all, Volta, who discovered the voltaic pile, which is the first battery. Faraday, who discovered the connection between electricity and magnetism. This is a Barlow wheel, which is actually the first moving devices into that early motor. And Edison, who showed that you could create light from electricity. This is an early Edison bulb. So, the invention of engines freed humans and animals from the drudgery of repetitive and laborious work and also made it much more efficient. So, early in the early world, the only way to get a lot of laborious work done was to have slaves and drive them by force to do the work. But now the engines do it, so humans are much more free. And this, of course, was known as the Industrial Revolution. So, the main kinds of machines that changed the world, let's spend a little time on that. Well, there are machines for travel, trains, ships, cars. Nowadays, we are going to add spaceships to it if you are rich enough. Machines for light, bulbs, tubes, LEDs today. Who knows what it will be in the future? Machines for flight, planes, rockets, and as I said, spaceships, if you can afford it. Machines for communication. The telegraph, the telephone came first, then the TV, the cell phone, the internet. You're hearing me through a fairly sophisticated device, which would not have been thinkable even 20 years ago. Diagnostic machines for, me for medicine, the X-ray, the stethoscope, the endoscope, the MRI, which tell you about the inside of the body. Thinking machines, computers, calculators, iPads, iPhones, you're using that to listen to me. And of course, you will do it for your calculations. Other inventions which have changed the world in other ways, firearms, recording devices like the camera and other things, then writing devices like the press, today typewriter, printer, artificial fertilizers, fertilizers, plant hormones have changed the nature of agriculture, given us the green revolution, for example. Plastics of all kinds, and we are surrounded by them. And not less is portable medicines. Today you can carry your pills, you can carry pacemakers, prosthetics. Earlier, if you had a serious illness, you would be confined to your home. Today you can do all your work. You simply carry your pills in your pocket. So what are the objectives of modern technology? These are all the results of technology. First of all, as an aid to science, they increase the scope of human penetration into the secrets of nature. I mean, much of the things you have seen, even there, even the microscope telescope, these are all technology. The second is to for is convenience. They make the activities of human life easier by taking over some things which were earlier done by humans or animals. They also generate wealth. So the sale of a new technology or increase in productivity of a commodity which you can sell, and this is perhaps the the, the, the part of technology which governments and uh, economists love, that you can get money from it. Social service, you can use technology and it is being used to improve the condition of the needy and deprived section of society by making the facilities and commodities easily available. So that's not less. And finally, it generates time. By speeding up human activities, it increases your effective lifespan. For example, if you had to do all your calculations by, you know, long multiplication, long division, Think of the total amount of time you would have spent on it, which you have saved by using your calculator. So that time you could use for something else. So effectively, it has increased your lifespan. It has increased the time you could have devote, you could devote to other things. Even if you devote it to just relaxing, you have more time to relax. There is also the issue of misuse of science and technology, which I think we should be aware of. So the first one is indifference. You know. People have thought of furthering human knowledge at the cost of human or animal suffering. This is called vivisection, which is really a dissection or, or, or experiments on, on humans or animals. And uh, that is actually a misuse. There is the issue of selfishness. Science and technology could be used to make the lives of a small section of the population comfortable 
and the cost of misery for the rest. Global warming is a classic example. The selfishness of the rich nations in not stopping their carbon emissions is having desperate, desperately bad consequences for people in other parts of the world. Climate change is real and it is happening and it is affecting people. Then there is the question of exploitation. So the idea is to sell commodities at exorbitant prices to technology and undeveloped people. This is called mercantilism. You may have studied somewhere that the British did it in India. They took away raw goods from India, manufactured it and sold it back to Indians at much higher price. And this is still being done on a worldwide scale in many ways. Then there is the domination. You can use your technology to increase your power by terrorizing or subduing others, which is the idea of colonialism, which again, we have suffered in India from the British doing it to us. There is also mischievous use of technology, but it can help you to enhance criminal activity. Cybercrime is one example, for example, which, uh, which you know, which, which, has, which is being used increasingly, and these are dangers. The point is that science and technology bring with them new issues in ethics and social responsibility for which we are simply not prepared. There are new things which we have, which were never thought of before. Take, for example, the nuclear weapons. Today, it's a real danger. And earlier, there were never weapons with which you could destroy the world. Today, that's there and it's going increasingly into the hands of people whose responsibility uh, is suspect. So that is one thing. Then for, I'll take another example. The technology to make human clothes exists. And with human clothes, perhaps you could create a world in which only a few human types exist. And everyone is the same and doing the same kind of work. So it's a, it's a mechanical and, uh, and I would say human world. So how much of this should be allowed? It should not be allowed. These are not questions which are easily answered. Then uh, increasingly, we are able to make our you know, you can make an artificial hand, artificial uh, leg, and so on. And sooner or later, we will come to the situation when you can create a cyborg, which is, uh, which is, which has a human brain, but the body parts are all mechanical and, of course, uh, robotic, and that will increase your power a lot. Now, is it good to do these things? So, you know, we search the ancient religions and philosophies. We have a lot of them. But it's vain to find instructions on how to approach these because these things were never thought of when these came. You must remember that all the ancient religions and ethical systems of the world were all founded more than a thousand years ago. Some much more and some uh, over the years and they found their final form. Uh, the, the last of them perhaps is, is, is Islam which came in 630, around 630. But they are all very old. And you know, the founders and preachers of these religions did not tell us or did not tell us what to do with these new moral and ethical issues. We do need a new class of revolutionary thinkers who will formulate ethics for these times. Time is right for a new generation or a new type of teacher who will tell us how to think about the world, this world of science and, and technology. Right now we are sort of groping in the dark. All right, enough of gloomy things. Let's talk about the future. And uh, of course, now I'm really up a speculation, but it's sort of educated speculation. I will first quote to you a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, Locksley Hall in 1835. And it's a beautiful vision of the future. Let me, let's quote it. He says, for I dipped into the future, far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be, saw the heavens filled with commerce, Argosies of mass, magic sails, violets of the purple twilight dropping down with costly bales. Till the war drum throbbed no longer, the battle flags were furled in the parliament of man, the federation of the world, and so on. And the kindly earth shall slumber, lapped in universal law. So he dreamed of a world of peace. And of course, the pilots coming with cargo, because that is, that is happening today. In 1835, one could not think of flight. We do have our cargo planes, passenger planes, we are all taking flights from here to there. So you see here, of course, that this is a picture of the UN in Geneva, flags of all countries, and ideally, this should bring peace to the world. 
it's not been it's been successful in some ways of course there are places where it has been spectacularly unsuccessful here is a picture of some of our uh, friends from the taliban and of course uh, so these issues do need to be addressed so perhaps it is science which will bring peace to a warring and competitive world this is a beautiful uh, drawing by a person called shaheed again from afghanistan who was actually killed by the taliban in their previous uh, rule of afghanistan but before he died he painted this beautiful dream of a world you know the dove is the symbol of peace and would uh, the world come in the hands of peace and perhaps it is science which will bring peace to a war in the world we will of course be probing deeper and deeper into the structure of matter here is a plot of the energy and length goes inversely as energy the length scale to which you can probe so over the years this is it kept in peace it's almost increased this is a logarithmic plot it's almost increased on a linear scale so we will certainly this is where we are today and we will certainly go deeper and deeper and deeper into the structure of matter as we go deeper into the structure of matter this will tell us more about the universe because remember that the universe was created as a very tiny object in the big bang and the first few moments after the big bang and we can recreate these and take us close to the moment of creation itself so after the big bang the world just kept expanding like this taking to us to those high energies will reproduce those few moments and perhaps you will understand more about why the universe is as it is today and how it is of course the cost of these high energy experiments is becoming prohibitively expensive for example the cost of finding the higgs boson this is a picture of the lhc which is the large hadron collider instrument which was used to find it the cost of this was about five and a half times the cost of our flagship aircraft carrier, the Vikramaditya, which you see on the right. Of course, you can argue that whether it is good to have warships, whether they are needed, but you get the idea that this was enormously costly. So an American politician, in fact, he was questioning the funding of anti physics. He once said, we've got enough quarks already. Why do we need another one for? So that attitude will certainly come. Why do we need to know more? Uh, let's save our money and stay ignorant. So there is urgent need for technologies to generate these high energies, which will tell us about the deeper structure of matter. So one possibility is to use lasers, perhaps. Perhaps one can use plasmas and generate uh, fusion power out of those. One important thing is grid computation, which will definitely replace the W World Wide Web and Internet and even cloud computation will be changed. I'll tell you a little about the grid. What is the idea? The grid involves creating a worldwide network based on lasers and optical fiber connections. But essentially, every computer, every cell phone, every device with a uh, central processing unit will be a part of the grid. Of course, except those involved in secret projects which will be taken out of the grid. But otherwise, your cell phone, your computer, everything will be part of the connected to the grid. And there will be a centralized routers which will distribute all jobs over the grid in the most effective manner. So this will marshal the entire computing power of the world together and there will be a grid which will control everything. So already we have things like Alexa, which will be in your house and which will control the things in your house. So effectively there will be a time where the grid will enable remote control of everything, including transport, perhaps surgery, teaching, everything will happen through the grid. At some stage the grid will be the main controller of the world and you will only depend for everything. You will talk to the grid and ask ask it to do something like that. This is the world, with, this is the reality which is going to happen. We can see it's going to come. We will be able to understand much better how matter is formed and it sticks together to form structures. Already this is a picture of an electron wave in a, in a solid and you can actually see it. Here's the picture. So you will be able to find, take such pictures and see how they stick together to form structures. Nanotechnology is something new that you will be able to make machines at the nano scale. So you see here a little fan which has been made at the micro scale of 10 microns, okay, 10 micrometers, 1 billionth of a meter. And we will be able to make such devices. We are already making such devices. And nanotechnology has endless possibilities. For example, you can manipulate atoms to create synthetic molecules with totally new properties. And this has been only done to write IBM, but you could actually 
create new molecules which are otherwise difficult to make. You could have a new revolution in nanoelectronics and the construction of nano robots. You see here a little nano robot within the blood, the human blood. Those are human blood cells. And perhaps you could send these in to cure disorders, diseases, and so on. So it's pretty wonderful. So, of course, there is a danger with these. Uh, skin, oh, sorry. You could also build self assembling nanobots. One day they will take over much of manufacturing processes, surely. There are also dangers in them because if these have a mind of their own, there is this rather frightening book by Michael Christian uh, that when these nanobots form a swarm and start hunting people. And here you see a uh, still from the film, which is pretty frightening. But nevertheless, we will have those. And new materials will, of course, also take over much of everyday life. Instead of conventional glass, you'll have self cleaning glass. You'll never need to clean it again. There will be, you can take your light, fold it and put it in your pocket and take it out. Your mobile phone will probably look like this in the near future. Then there's graphene, which is the world's strongest material. It's a million times thinner than paper, but 200 times stronger than steel. So you could build uh, nano devices, micro devices with this, which are in the pipeline. They will be happening. Finally, there will be new kinds of foods and they will also be created. And perhaps at one time we will be eating only artificial foods. I, 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 I hope I don't live to see that age, but perhaps such an age will come. Then 3D printing, you know, already now today, if you want to buy a, buy a house in some uh, locality, then the architect will show you a plan like this. But increasingly, the architect will also show you plans like this. And this is the reality. So 3D printing is going to take over much of the graphic arts. It will be in, the, in three dimensions. Once again, let's come back to diseases. The fear of disease is going to reduce further. So I think some of these diseases, which you know, we are, which are the, are the scourge of today's life, uh, I think we will find cures for some of these. And of course, I'm sure we will find a cure for this uh, particular one, which is uh, the fear of the world at the moment. The span of human life will perhaps go beyond a century or more. So so uh, there's this famous book by Bernard Shaw in the early 1900s. So in the Bible, Methuselah lived 969 years, but Bernard Shaw predicted that human life will go beyond 100 years. It's already in some countries gone up to 80, 85 years. This is also going to happen. And, you know, perhaps at some stage, uh, life can go on and on indefinitely by preserving the brain connected to a robotic body. That's the cyborg I talked about. So, you know, uh, as we have in the Gita, uh, the soul uh, moves from one body to the other. Perhaps the brain will move from one robotic body to the other and practically live forever. These are possibilities which will happen, which can happen in the future. However, what about the world population? This is how the world population has grown since 1800 and to the prediction of 2050, you can see the steep rise. These are billions. So steep rise and it may be close to nine and more than nine billion by 2050. So we are somewhere, where are we here? Somewhere around here. Okay. So daily, 2,15,000 people are added to the world. Now this has a major problem. Let's do a little bit of arithmetic. This is the only uh, serious science I'll be doing in this talk. The world population now is about 7.9 billion. And the total farming land in the world is about is about 1.72 uh, lakh uh, crore kilometers, square kilometers. But that means that the farming land per person is about 40, it's just like a, it's like a plot of about 47 meters square, which is not bad. Because 47 meters is roughly half the length of the Victoria Memorial. <coughs> so it's a fairly decent sum, uh, plot of land, and that's the one which is average for every person. The world cereal uh, production is so much, uh, 2.7 billion kilograms per year. And that means that if you do it, take it per person, then you can get about 950 grams per day of cereal. But of course, av average adult requires only about 600 grams per day. So we are still doing okay for food. So the world has enough, as uh, Mahatma Gandhi said, for everyone's need. That's clear from the numbers but not for everyone's greed. That is why you see 
scenes like this, which I'm sure all of you have seen, which I which really tell you that the world does need a lot of change. Well, but in the years to come, we will face a serious food crisis. And this was pointed out by Thomas Malthus in 1798, long ago. The point is that population grows exponentially. You've seen it grows like a curve like this. But food resources, for example, and other resources grow linearly. So such a curve is always going to cross at some point. So if you plot time on this side and population or resources on this side, there will be a time where the population crosses the amount of resources available. And that will be a point when there's to be fighting for that. So the only natural solution is for large numbers of people to die, either by starvation, war, pestilence, natural disasters. And so these are known as Malthusian checks. So there are only two ways out of it. One is to increase the production of material resources. The other is to somehow control the population. So population can be controlled in many ways. One is by retarding births, but that's not good in the long run. But whatever we do, only if we can reduce these, will this Malthusian uh, crisis point be avoided. And whatever we do, we will need science to do that. So some of the other ways to reduce the population pressure is that one day we will build colonies on the moon, I'm sure. One day we will build cities that float on the sea, that is also coming, I'm sure. Perhaps we will move into the depths of the earth and build cities and settlements there. We will voyage to distant planets. So these sound like science fiction today, but I should tell you that many of the things which were science fiction in my childhood are the, are the world of reality, including giving this talk to you. When I was a child, then these were the things which were written of in science fiction books. And here it's a reality. So these things will become reality. And finally, we will build new civilizations, perhaps on new planets in new places. And once again, once we have built that, then we will again claim to be the lords of the universe. As the, the world, we, the medieval ages, we thought of the earth as the center and claimed that humanity, perhaps, in a new way, will claim to be lords of the universe. Then. So I would like to sort of, uh, conclude this thing by telling you that science is the greatest and noblest of all human enterprises. And those who join this great adventure, they become at the same time explorers of nature and you become benefactors of society by what you do. And at the same time, you are also enjoying yourself immensely. At least you should be. So I will, as my last slide, I'll show you this thing. But people do not do science only for the benefits you can get out of it. You do it because you're curious to understand something. Something seems mysterious. So that is, Einstein said, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious, is the source of all true art and all science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead, his eyes are closed. So let us keep our eyes open. Let us have this sense of wonder and then let us uh, take the future ahead through science and technology, but also in a responsible way. So with that, I'll close my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you enjoyed it and have something to think about in the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful lecture. So students, you are requested to ask any question you like to Professor Aichodri. Well, thank you for all the claps and all the applause. Sir, if anyone uh, has any questions. My name is Oniruddha. I have a yes. question. Yes. Can you can you please repeat who in who invented the planning of battle tanks? Leonardo da Vinci. He's the same person who painted the Last Supper and the Mona Lisa. He was also a scientist. So he had this idea of battle tanks. But of course, his tank was powered by a horse. So there was a covered thing, covered object with a horse inside, and there would be people inside with holes to shoot. So it was like a moving 
so the same idea of course except that a horse is not strong enough to pull a pull, pull an armored thing like that so therefore once we have generated machines and caterpillar tracks the same thing can happen so the armored vehicle or the tank the idea is there only the the engine to drive it was not there similarly as you know leonardo da vinci invented the heli the helicopter but he didn't have any but he tried to make a make it you know manipulable by a by a human being human beings are not strong enough to be able to generate the energy to fly to carry our own weight they are not strong enough to do that birds are because a bird on the human scale is much stronger than it so we had to wait till there could be engines which would do that job but the ideas the principles everything was worked out by leonardo da vinci okay sir thank you I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, quite frank, that is it possible uh, to collaborate human brains in robots? Uh, just you say. Really it is already happening. It is already happening. You see, what happens when you know people have these artificial heads and so on? They are connected to your nerves. and they pick up the nervous the signals which come from their nerves so you can actually use an artificial hand like an ordinary hand okay now this is going to develop further and further now how far it's going to be possible to convey your the mechanical things are certainly possible whether it can convey your thoughts and emotions is a different issue that we do not because okay, but it's perhaps it will happen one day so these are ethical questions whether we should be able to enable a robot to have thoughts and emotions and inventiveness beyond that whether we should think of allow robots to have you know become too independent these are long term questions which have to be answered and we are not answering them we are going ahead with the technology but we have not uh, thought of what it would, what influence it would have on society there are some of the things i want you to think about thank you sir any more questions any more questions from you students sir yes who is it sir my name is akash sharma koi ki bangla e question korte bolo tao korte bolo sir bangla te uttor deben Akash wanted to say something. Akash Verma. Sir, I, I want to say something. Uh, I have no doubt, sir. Okay. Sir, I have a question also. That yes. Can you please please can you please discuss the concept of genomes, and how is relatable with the uh, cyborg? No, genomes and cyborg are different concepts. Huh? So, genome basically is a is telling you that what is the type what are the genes you have okay so as you know the, the the genetic structure is encoded in the dna of a human being okay of of any 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 living creature the dna carries uh, the 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 code genetic code so basic on on that dna is replicated when the reproduction happens so and a, a, a new life comes a new uh, uh, organism happens based on that dna so the way the so the dna is based i don't know if you know this on four bases so there are they are called a t g and c so based on these uh, not g uh, yeah a t g and c so based on these four there's a code it's like writing a code with four letters okay so all the combinations which come with this that particular set of combinations is unique to every particular organism and among us humans it's unique to every human so uh, to find out exactly that list you know it, it, it typically look like a a t t g g a d a t g g and so on. this particular code is called the genome okay so this has to do with the living object a cyborg is a different concept a cyborg is is, is an object is is a person who is uh, where the brain is human but all the body parts are robotic so of course they can be much stronger than that they are stronger or more powerful and so on and suppose you had telescopic eyes you had uh, 
very powerful lens and so on that would be a side effect yeah sir i i, I was thinking that uh, the genetic codes must must be uh, modified to create uh, cyborgs or modern humans uh, i think so perhaps perhaps i don't maybe that would also be needed yeah. I can't tell you. Well, the, this is the technology of the future, so perhaps it would have to be modified. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. You're welcome. Any more questions from student side? Any more okay, questions? We should stop the number because I also have to go. Okay, so I, I think, sir, there are no more questions. Thank you for the very nice lecture you have given, sir. And thank you again for all the students for listening to Sir patiently and asking him questions. So I think we should end the session right now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for inviting me again. And, I'm uh, hope, and I hope you enjoyed it. Yes, okay, goodbye. We forward to your lectures in next future. And I request yes. your students to Thank continue you. with the session in the second half from 2.30. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Ashupio. Nah, let's stop the recording. Yes, you please stop the recording. <laughs>